sort of letters they've received from other people. Um, and then sort of in the afternoons and evenings, as far as we can see so far, and we've not completed this research, that tends to be when the kind of the notable work happens, um, when copying um, kind of craft activities seem to take place. And then often when Hamilton's in on her own in her room, she, she will kind of re read as well. Um, and so the more collaborative reading practices, the ones that seem to take place in company, um, tend to be where the texts are selected by the Duchess or by Mary Delaney for Hamilton. And these get interwoven with personal knowledge of the subject, um, the inheritance of the texts, um, and Hamilton seems to see this as something she's responsible for recording. So preserving and handing on the memories of, of this circle and of the generations. And this sense of responsibility appears strongly inflected um, by that friendship she has with them, this intergenerational friendship and that sense of a longer history. Um, and Hamilton often reflects on how she wishes to deserve the good opinion of these friends um, and the good opinion that they express to her or that she kind of records in, in kind of slight astonishment and, and rapture. Um, and this work seems to be part of that duty, part of deserving that good opinion. So this brings me, I hope, quite neatly to the concept of curation more broadly. Um, so these were the ideas that kind of kicked off um, the conversation Anne and I had about this archive, which is largely paper, um, but has so many traces of material objects, about what items are deemed important, are handed down and kept for, pos for posterity, and the role that women's creative practices, textual or otherwise, play in a kind of community coherence, philanthropy and patronage relationships. So when we, we were discussing what items to display today, it seemed fitting to seek out items in the Rylands that exemplified crafting practices, um, but also sharing of expertise and social exchange in material culture, and allow us to think about the role of making along other sides of creative or intellectual work, um, such as reading or, not, or writing, or ideas of women's knowledge, um, which as the Hamilton Diaries show, is exactly how this process happened. So I'm gonna hand over to Anne for a moment to tell us about some of the items. Yep, so we're, we're lucky um, in the John Rylands that although obviously we have a wealth of material that is either manuscript or printed um, and archival material, throughout all of those collections we have examples of material culture. And so although we are going to show you some um, archival material today, we're also going to show you some objects, um, some examples of the kind of material culture that um, Cassie has been speaking about, textile works, for example, um, samplers, so that we can sort of evidence this kind of practice through um, not only time, but through different kind of um, uh, social standing, for example, and it will, um, speak to those networks of women who are continually uh, practicing this craft right up to people who are kind of making it uh, not only craft but actually art with uh, hopefully finishing with one of our May Morris bindings. But if we begin by taking a look at Hamilton's uh, diary, we can switch, um, oh we've switched already to the camera, thank you Jack, and I will zoom in so that we can take a bit of a closer look at the diary. So as Cassie was saying, this is from December 1973 to January 1974, and it's covering that uh, period where she's at Bulstrode Park with Mary Delaney and the Duchess of Portland. Um, and I believe that Mary Delaney herself was something of an embroiderer and someone who was um, actually quite proficient in needlework. Yes. So we're continually getting this, um, we're continually getting Let's go a little bit out of focus. There we go. We're continually getting this um, engagement with these kind of um, works through throughout all these networks. Um, when we we come a little bit later, we'll see May Morris, for example, her mother Jane Morris was also a very proficient um, embroideress. So if we just open this up, you can see that although it is a diary, we've been able to even even write in. A few pages in, we're going to try and get a little bit closer. We can see the section where, let me just move this camera. You have to forgive me, we do all this backwards, <laughs> <laughs> which is a little bit tricky. 
I don't know if you can just make out the words here where it says spinning wheel. So we have Mrs Delaney, she had her spinning wheel. Um, and this is the section where um, she's trying to, to show her. Does she say she's fringe? Yes, yeah, so she, so I just, I my little table and fringe knotting. So while Mary yeah. Delaney's spinning, Mary Hamilton's doing a different craft yeah. in the same room. So unfortunately, we don't have any examples of fringe knotting, which is quite, um, <laughs> it's quite <laughs> a difficult thing to find, but we will be able to show examples of other textile making as yes. we go through. We can also see that she's done a beautiful cover for this diary, which I'm going to swap it around because it is upside down. Yes, I don't know why the tree is <laughs> upside down. I don't know if she drew the tree on the paper and then used it later to cover the manuscripts. Because yeah. this is the other thing. This is what we would call a manuscript book. It's not a pre-bound notebook. She's just made a cover for it. Yeah. And that's something she talks about doing actually in the diaries that Mary, Mary Delaney lends her lots of her own letters to take home and copy. And she kind of makes up papers to wrap them in. So probably like this just to keep them just to keep them safe while she's got them. So that's a kind of temporary binding. So I don't know how permanent these are really supposed to be, but when we think about books in this period, so so often we don't really think, well, we think about printed books, but what about manuscript books? What does that look like? And often it's just people have, have bought loads of paper and then kind of, she's pinned these together. together you can see yeah. if you open it up, um, there are actual pins through um, the yeah. margins. And, there's always a kind of a fun exercise to be had in checking because sometimes the pages aren't in the right order and you have to yeah. shuffle sections you around. Those sections are quite yeah. loose, aren't they? So it will be kind of folded sheets of paper. Yes, there's yeah. one, a little pin just in the margin there. So as an object itself, I think this diary has a lot to tell us about paper cultures and, and what, what a book was yeah. at this point. Yeah, and it is such a... it is. It's so funny that when it's the other way around, you don't really necessarily see the tree, but as soon as you turn it around, <laughs> it's a very beautiful sketch of a tree. <laughs> Did you want to look at any of the other two paper items or shall we move on to something? Well, I think just in the context of copying, um, yeah. one, we had a nice little image, didn't we, from the, um, oh, yes. from the gems yeah. collection. So yeah. we, we don't have ever so long. Um, so one of the things she talks about it's copying is yes, the um, Duke of Marlborough's Oops, that's fine. Duke of Marlborough's uh, gems collection. So this is a, basically a book that Duke of Marlborough has commissioned of the Lord, uh, Earl of Arundel's gem collection that he inherits. And there's a lovely little drawing here where she's sketched. So the gems are items of jewellery um, where she's sketched and kind of labelled up. You can see here that she's noted there's some emeralds and um, she talks about carnelian in centre. Um, so... This is just like her attempting to capture very briefly the, the paper items she's seeing that the Duchess of lent her. Um, so there's all sorts of little kind of scraps and bits in here as well, where you can see other, here, here's another example. Yeah, lovely, if I lift it? that off and you can see she's kind of cut it out around the yeah. shape of um, a little kind of icon there. Um, so these are all, items that she's seen in person as pieces of jewellery and then she's tried to kind of capture in, in her diary. I say that I think was just kind of worth having a look at. Mm. Um, how are we doing for time, Hannah? Okay. Should we have a look at some of the textiles? Yeah. Then? So what I will do is I will just... My colleague Kirsty, if you can bring Isabella... Yeah, if you can bring Isabella Banks's embroidery. Thanks. So I think this is just really good and as an example of kind of not only work, but actually um, how girls of a certain age would have been engaged in the kind of making and practicing from quite a young age. And so this is a little bit later, uh, but it is an example of a sampler which has been created by Isabella Varley, who, if you can see at the bottom there, just focus it in. It says Isabella Varley's work done in the 10th year of her age, 1831. And this is um, Isabella Varley, who was uh, after her marriage, Isabella Banks, who was the author of The Manchester Man. Um, 
what I really like is this, um, you know, tradition of it being um, something that would be a domestic skill that would be useful for, for women and used also as an educational tool. So she's obviously practicing her alphabet. Um, what's interesting about Isabella Banks is that she was um, again interested in needlework throughout her life and so not only is she interested from a very young age in kind of writing and publishing she has her first um, poem published by the Manchester Guardian when she's about 16 so not that long after this um, but she also published patterns throughout her lifetime um, on what is um, is it called a fancy work <laughs> <laughs> um, and so but I think this idea of it being kind of girls particularly being exposed to this at such a young age and it just becoming um, something that they are so um, usually engaged mm. with, very interesting. This is obviously later now than the Hamilton, but this is still something that is being engaged yeah. with. One of the things I love about these samplers as well is that it's what quite an unusual instance, I guess, of, um, it's autobiography, isn't it? You know, you've mm. got, her age in 1831, so in her 10th year, so she would have been nine. Um, so already you've got some biographical detail there and it, it's before marriage as well. So you've got her with her maiden name mm -hmm. kind of going, here are my skills and this is, you know, who I am and where I sit in the world. And I, I don't think it's very conscious in that way, but I now look at that as a literary historian and think, okay, this is, this is now some biographical detail. I can build the picture of this, this person in, in the kind of data form actually. Um, which is something that is very difficult with women often when you're trying to write biographies of women, particularly if you don't know their maiden name, for example, mm. um, or find them once they're married to you know, who knows who. So, so it's wonderful to see that. And I'm sure Hamilton would have been doing things like this herself as well. I think what's interesting about Banks is when you were talking about the Duchess of Portland being a collector, the reason that we have this and, you know, thinking about how and what gets kind of... Um, saved and what gets collected this is actually a collection of Isabella Banks's own works and relics that she collected which sits within another collection <laughs> uh, familiarly enough and so um, she was also doing that curating yeah. and pulling things together um, and saving particular mm. things for particular reasons I mean obviously this is as you say sort of um close to her um, personally, but the, the breadth of that collection is quite interesting. So I suppose on the one hand, we've got that kind of idea of posterity and curation, but we've also got the sharing of knowledge. And that's something that we were talking about with the Stanford collection. Um, so Lady Stanford, uh, we have an item from Lady Stanford that and we'll talk more about um, that is kind of passing on a pattern. And we've got lots of examples mm -hmm. in the Hamilton letters, for example, Hamilton's Aunt Lady Hamilton writing to her mother, Mary Catherine Hamilton, telling her where to get the cheap silks, Coventry, apparently. Um, <laughs> and also uh, the Lady Lady Warwick, who's Hamilton's cousin's wife, thanking her for a dress pattern of her own dress that she sent. So Hamilton's worn dress and, and Lady Warwick has gone, oh, that's lovely. And, and you know, she sent the pattern. So there is a kind of sharing of knowledge. Mm. Um, so could we have a very yeah, we'll quick take a look, look at, at the that. Stamford yeah. item just before we move on to the final book? So what's kind of really notable is in amongst, you know, all this writing that's going on, there's also a movement of material things, patterns, bits of lace, um, exactly like what Anne's going to show you here. Okay, so I'm going to have to focus in quite a bit on this. So, um, We'll just quickly show you that this comes as a pair. This comes with a letter. Goodness, this focus. There we go. So this comes with a letter, um, which you can see begins my very dear Louisa. And it is actually, I'll not talk about the, the entire contents of the letter, but it is from um, Stamford, Lady Stamford, who is, isn't she the Duchess of Portland's daughter? She is, yes, yeah, she's so um, we've got a connection there yeah. already. With um, with Mary Hamilton, um, but and she does meet her. So oh, does she? Yeah, 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 yeah. She's in the diaries. And so, I'll swap it round. There is also enclosed 
this very sweet little package, which it's having a little bit of trouble picking up, um, which has in it Do you mind just passing me those um, weights? Thank you. This very sweet example that has been sent. And what I really like about this is not only how skillful it is, because it really is um, a really beautiful little example, but it, that it's sent as a token of affection to one of her um, granddaughters. So it's part of um, not only that network of sharing these skills but it's something quite personal as well yeah. a really kind of um intimate exchange really between women which i think is um really lovely and and, and when things like this exist in the archives and are saved within the archives it's such a joy because very often we see these things written about yeah. and we don't have any sense of what those physical items mm -hmm. were we don't have the material culture but here is an example where we do have that which is beautiful I think we're quite close to our speaking time. Okay, oh, don't. Um, well, I thought yeah. maybe we could bring the other book out while we're kind of getting set up for yeah. questions. So if we, um, yeah, bring just back as a Mary comparison with the May first Morris. item yeah. we showed. Superb. I'll just make sure that that's nice and stable. Yes, thanks, Kirsty. So just as a kind Wonderful. of. <laughs> final aha um we have here from two different periods two examples of women covering books um and so when Anne produced this beautiful um embroidered piece I thought oh we should get out the diary because that's got a book cover as well but you can see they're rather different <laughs> different Definitely. things in terms of execution <laughs> So just really quickly to show you this one, because it is an absolute beauty, is um, the embroidered binding by Mae Morris of one of her father's translations, um, uh, produced by the Kelmscott Press. Um, but it is just exquisite embroidery. And I think what, why we kind of felt like it was in, important to close with Mae Morris is, is just to kind of see how, although this is 100 years later, um, this is taking embroidery and that skill to a different level, not only commercial, but also she'd set, um, Mae Morris was instrumental in setting up a, a, an art guild. Um, so she was actually, she was taking it really from craft to art. And so, you know, there's a really lovely kind of timeline and progression of um, taking this to the absolute next level. And it's just, it's, it's an absolute joy to see this, this binding anyway. We just got lots of lovely things. Out, we did, we? Yeah. we got lots of exciting <laughs> things to, to show you. So um, That's we can pass back and to you fact, to close. Find women making covers for books in the early modern yeah. period and even earlier as well. Yeah. Anyway, just... thanks so much for that. Ooh. So interesting. I wonder if we have any questions. I did have um, one, yeah. sorry, is there a question? No, no, I can't see the, yeah. <laughs> Did I see the chat, please? Yes, thanks. Okay. I've got comments from things, especially Jeanette. Jeanette's getting very excited about <laughs> how beautiful <laughs> they are. Thank you, that's great. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I just, in high yeah, I'm sorry, you, the David. focus does <laughs> take a moment. Yeah, yeah. And apologies about the closed captioning. I can't read that so far. Is that other thing? Yeah. I don't think we have any specific questions, so I, I will ask you okay, a question. And, and I'm interested in, in women making things and crafting and samplers. And I just wondered how much somebody who we associate, um, you know, having to like reading and writing, how much of her time is actually spent doing these other forms of making activities in a day? That's a really good question. And um, something that I don't think I really appreciated until I started um, working on this archive. And it's also something that came, I, I attended a paper by Natasha, Natasha Simonova, who's yeah. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. researcher at Oxford, who's, who's working on um, kind of women's reading and letters, particularly uh, kind of pointing out 
that women would often be read to while they were doing other things like having their hair done. So actually women were very efficient um, because they'd be doing, you know, one of them would read out and the other one would carry on with her notable work. So this phrase notable work turns up all the time. Um, and we think it's kind of code for embroidery. And I know there will be fashion historians who, and kind of craft historians who know more about this. Um, but there's always more than one thing happening at once, it seems. So yeah. time is always very well used. So I don't, as a proportion of Hamilton's time, I mean, we probably could track that in some way. It's not something we've been doing. Um, but I think for Hamilton, more than, say, the Duchess of Portland, you know, more than her elite friends with more money, she does need to do quite a lot of her own work. So um, when she has to go to be presented at court after she's left, well, no, sorry, has, she goes to a ball at um, the prince's house and she doesn't have anything to wear and she's really worried. But then I think Anna Marie, her housemate, gives her some fabric that can be made into a dress. So there's always a little bit of kind of scrimping and saving. At one point, she does kind of mend some things to be worn as well. So for her, it is a practical skill that she needs because of her financial circumstances, which although she's um, from a very good family, she's not from the very rich branch of that family. Um, and she's very clear that she doesn't want to be in debt to anyone. So she doesn't run up bills. She doesn't um, kind of take things on account. She, and she mentions at one point that she always pays for things immediately because she doesn't want to be in debt to anyone. So for her, being able to mend her own clothes, being able to make things up new is really, really important. It doesn't answer your question about time, no, no. but I think it gives you a sense of the right. role it I would mean, play. I think women do embroider yeah. and talk at the same time, yeah. very often, so it's socialising. Megan, you've asked, how did the collection come to be in the Rylands? We did talk about this at the beginning, but Anne can tell you very quickly again. Yeah, it was purchased in um, 2007 after having been in the Anson family for, um, for uh, after it was Hamilton's own collection, it went to the Anson family and it was within that family right up until it was um, purchased in 2007 and then it's been here ever since. And I think thinking of it as, as a collection really starts with Mary herself because she yes. itemises, but she goes through her letters often. She talks about doing this in the diaries that she kind of sorts her letters and she kind of archives them and labels them and, um, and says kind of who they're from and on what day, even though you can work out from the contents, she will kind of itemise things and when she's received them. So she's already thinking of posterity, I think when she hands these things down to her daughter. Um, Jeanette asks about other examples of craft and pressed flowers in the Rylands collections. This ephemera is very evocative, evocative glimpse of women's lives and friendship. Um, that we do have um, other examples of craft. We had some actually here that we were we were hoping to show. So I might just <laughs> might just pull one out if we have time in a few minutes. But we have things like um, sewing needles from um, the Wesleys. We have um, lots of examples of exchanges of things like wedding dresses, pieces of wedding dresses. Um, again, centred perhaps around kind of life events for women, you know, kind of christenings, weddings, that kind of thing. Um, pressed flowers, I know that we do have some, we don't have any out today, but one thing is uh, that I'm particularly interested in, and I did ask Cassie about this before, is, is hair and the exchange of hair. We have, um, <laughs> we have letters in, in the Hamilton archive that speak of um, somebody losing a hair ring and asking for more hair to make a ring. And it's not just necessarily in that mind of, you know, Victorians using it for memorial purposes, but more just um, missing other people. And I think, you know, um, it's quite intimate, isn't it? That kind of exchange of hair. And I think you were talking about some, was it being, Hamilton being asked? So I think the Prince of Wales asks her for some hair, which we think she doesn't grant, mm. but there is some hair in the Hamilton collection, which we assume is either hers or Louise's. So she may have given a lock. Of, I wouldn't see why she wouldn't give a lock of hair to John Dickinson, given mm. she ultimately married him. Um, but we, we don't know exactly whose that is. But um, yeah, it's, it's kind of an intimate thing as yeah. well so it's not you talk about kind of missing people and absence yeah. and, and particularly in the Victorian period morning rings but it's also just touching a bit of somebody's body isn't it you know yeah. having a piece of them with you yeah but the, the exchange of clothes I think is and or pieces of clothes mm. I think is also really interesting but yes we, ha we have lots of material um we I'm sure we can post some links to things up as well in the chat 
Um, somebody who doesn't give their name says, are the correspondents talking politics or gossiping? I, I will let yes, you answer both. that, but I would say <laughs> in the 18th century, there is no distinction. Between Absolutely. The, the answer is they're doing both at the same time, um, particularly the circles Hamilton's moving in. You know, so many of the men in her life are either MPs or, you know, her uncle's an ambassador. Um, and of course, this is the point at which the Duchess of Devonshire is getting very involved in politics. And so there's lots of gossip about her that is also about politics, but it's commenting both on kind of the political situation and her conduct as, a, as an elite woman in a largely masculine sphere. So, yeah, absolutely. And certain correspondents like Dorothy Blossett are more interested in politics than other correspondents who are maybe less so, but gossip is political. I think even now gossip, but particularly in this period in Hamilton Circle, gossip is always political. Yes, there's no, there's no delineation between no. the two, particularly <laughs> people of a, an elite status, I think. Mary Chadwick asks, uh, is there any comment on the well-being aspect of crafting? Now, people wouldn't use that terminology in this period. No, but it's a really would, good question. They would understand that concept. Yeah. Is it just a way of filling the time? What's it so, I mean, we, we do, um, one of the things we're recording in our kind of data dive into the archive is reading in relation to time. But there's also reading a social courtesy um, and doing things on behalf of others because, for example, they're not well enough or too tired. Um, but I don't know if that entirely answers the question. Um, but I'd have to think about it, Mary, and, and uh, drop me a line because it's, there's so much in there. I think well-being, as you say, isn't the term that would have been used, but certainly um, reading to others when, when they're they unwell. finish something, if they're crafting, do they ever comment on their pride or enjoyment or... Not really, do they just I do haven't it? noted it, but, that's, but I've been looking at reading mm. more than... I mean, this is kind of incidental to the research we've been doing, so I'd have to go looking for mm. it. I know there's one instance, and again, this is about reading, not craft, where Hamilton goes to see one of the Barnard sisters, and she reads to her, but then she, she reads her two things. She reads her a Hannah Moore poem um, and something else, I can't remember what, and then, and then she says, but I stopped there, I didn't want to read any more because I was worried that I'd wearied her. So she's kind of doing... It's kind of benevolent, actually, she's going to read this young woman who's not very well but there's a limit to how much good it can do her um and and Jane Barnard does later die so she's obviously very unwell mm. um and I don't think it was Hannah Moore's poem that did it but <laughs> we'll never know um but yeah I'll say yeah do feel free to drop me drop me a line Marion and I'll think about it further I think there's something interesting around the kind of usefulness of things as well I mean we mm. have um to Unfortunately, not time to show it, but there is um, a handbag that was created by Mary Charworth, who was um, the first love of Byron, whom she rejected. Um, and she's obviously Good made, choice. she's obviously, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she's obviously made that for herself, which was quite common, but it is also something that she would have used. So I think there is kind of maybe a bit of a difference about things that were things for leisure and things that were being like said made, made um, like when the twins were born and they're creating things that are useful to somebody um, and maybe sort of more fancy work as it were that is kind of um, perhaps for decoration or just just for, for leisure time but yeah it's um, it's an interesting question. I'd like to throw in um, a point as a, as a historian about the em emotional symbolism of a lot of these objects that you make things yourself to gift them or making samplers, particularly if they have, say, uh, religious content is a spiritual act. So crafting yeah. can also be about creating bonds and, mm. and links between family members and friends. So Absolutely. it could be more than just usefulness, which I agree with, mm. but also about um, the emotional meaning of objects, especially if you make them yourselves, I think. Sorry, I'm always talking about my own interests. I think we have a couple <laughs> more questions. Yes, are there any plans for an exhibition featuring Mary Hamilton? Well, probably at some point. Yes, <laughs> but, <laughs> the project perhaps, is ongoing. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps one of the answers to that is this whole project is about mm. producing an online edition. Um, so our main ambition is not producing a physical uh, um, exhibition, but what in some ways we're calling it an online edition, but actually it's an online exhibition mm. of all the letters and, and with transcriptions so people can read them for themselves um, and get lost in them. Yeah. So you will be able to see side by side the manuscript, um, the direct transcription of, of kind of what's word for word on the page, and also an expanded transcription that tells you who people are and expands words that have been sometimes erased or abbreviated. So yes, that 
in that sense, yeah, it's going to be made available in a kind of digital form through the Manchester Digital Collections, which is you know, flag, flagship, yes. very important and project for them. some of it's already there, if you look for Yes, it. I believe so, we've proved the link in, in the chat But there'll be point. far more. I'm conscious of the time, mm -hmm. so I'd like to thank Cassie and Anne for a fantastic um, talk today. I'd like to thank all the technical team behind the scenes who've been helping us out. Next, year's sem uh, next week's seminar, I should say, you don't have to wait that long, will be from the <laughs> Rylands once again, I think, and that will feature Guider Armstrong and John Hodgson talking about designing Dante in manuscripts and print, strategies on the page. You'll find more details about this and the last uh, couple of seminars in the series on the What's On page on the Rylands website, and you can um, register there from the Eventbrite link. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you all again next time. Thank you.